Hope everyone is doing well. And happy Sabbath from the Corrales family. Hello, happy Sabbath. We are the Troncoso family. We are doing well, thanks God. We are glad that you are here with us today. We hope to see you real soon in the church. Happy Sabbath, church. From our family to yours. We miss you. And we hope to see you soon. Good morning and happy Sabbath. Before we get into our service, here are a few announcements. Prayer meeting will be held September 9th starting at 7. For information, contact Ms. Prosper Lawanig. Don't forget to keep social distancing six feet apart. And if you do go out, don't forget your cute mask. The Southwestern Union will be holding a men's ministry meeting September 5th at 2 p.m. on Facebook. We want to thank you so much for your contributions to the El Paso Central SDA Church through your tithes and offerings. This week, the church fund was $5,473 with 12 cents, and the building fund was $4,772. Thank you so much. To drop off your tithes and offerings at the church, make sure to stop by September 2nd from 10 to 1. That's all for announcements this week. Have a happy Sabbath and enjoy the service. A missionary family packed their bags and prepared for a new adventure in Albania. God called Delmar, Nati, and three-year-old Clara to serve in the 1040 window. We are both from Brazil. I think God placed in our hearts the desire to serve in a different place, in a different environment, in a place where we wouldn't be like comfortable, something that will challenge both our ministries. And we realized very soon some of the challenges that we will face preaching and the gospel, bringing the gospel here to this country. For years, Albania was a communist territory, banning religion and declaring it the world's first and only atheist state. Communism collapsed in 1990, but even today, religion doesn't seem to be a priority for most people. There are only about 120 Adventists out of nearly 3 million people living in Albania. Delmar, Nati, and Clara were assigned to serve in the city of Korcha at the country's first Adventist church built in 1994. The first year was especially difficult. Despite their efforts, there wasn't a single baptism or anyone interested in Bible studies. In the end of my first year, I was really discouraged because I couldn't see anything really big happening in the church. You know, I couldn't see anything really even changing in the church. We associate big things with good numbers, big numbers. So in my first year, I was trying to do my best. I was working a lot to do something big or something important, according to my understanding. At the peak of Del Mar's frustration, he received a call to pastor a large church in Brazil. This offer seemed to come at the perfect time, and he shared the exciting news with his wife. I came and talked to my wife. You know, we got a call to go back to Brazil. What do you think? We're not doing anything here anyway. Why we don't accept that and we just leave? And that's it. She looked to me. She said, do you think that we did everything that we could here in Albania? Do you, do you really think that it's time for us to leave this place? She said, I personally think that we should stay, that the Lord has something prepared for us here. And maybe he wants to to teach us something here, and he still wants to use us. So they declined the opportunity in Brazil and prayed about how God could use them in this challenging part of the world. Delmar and Nati noticed that there were a lot of kids in their neighborhood. Maybe this was a good place to start. And then we also realized that Clara could be a good missionary to them. Because every time that uh, we were coming to our home or leaving our home, and the kids, they saw Clara. So they start saying, hey, Clara, Clara, let's play, let's do this, let's do that. We prepare like a, a place to play volleyball. And then we say to them, come, let's play together. And, and this just happened naturally. And the kids start coming to church and they start coming every week to church, like two times a week, playing volleyball, playing with us. And in a few weeks, they knew me as a pastor, they knew Nati, they knew very well Clara. And we were so excited because now the church was full. They recruited help in the form of two Adventist volunteers from Brazil and community volunteers. 
One of the members, Angela, brought her friend Fatione to church with her every few months. Fatione and I, we just connect as a friend and we start talking about God. We start studying the Bible together. I invite him to be part of our group and he just was excited. He was really engaged with us. And he said, you know, that's what I want. I want to participate. I want to help these kids. I want to serve this community. And in just a few weeks, he was already helping us with the kids. And the kids also loved him. All these activities just brought us together. And I had the privilege to baptize Fation as my first Baptist here in Albania. And I was so happy to see that the Lord was answering to our prayers. The love of Jesus touched Fation's heart, and he now shares this with others. When we follow this Jesus method in other peoples in the community, I pray for the hearts to get warm and, and to follow Jesus. This church has seen many new faces in the past few months. Church members are connecting with the community through a global mission urban center of influence. Nati uses her gift of music to teach classes to the kids. They love learning to play the violin. The center also offers language courses and a health club with plans to branch out with more programs. So when you try something new and then you see that it's working, it already gives you like more hope. And then this also gave us motivation to try different things, not just not one approach. Please pray for this ministry as it continues to grow and integrate into the community. And pray for missionary families like Delmar, Nati and Clara, who are serving on the front lines of mission. When we were called to come as a missionary, I thought that I was ready to change the world. But it took maybe one year to realize that before I do anything, the Lord was trying to change me. Thank you for supporting the mission of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. <laughs> okay, você gosta de morar na Albânia? Sim? Just to remind you of the guidelines I have shared with you before, if you plan to attend our church reopening on the 4th of July and thereafter, here are they. First, please register your name and family members by texting 915-227-5633 or emailing proscal at yahoo.com or registering at our church website, alpasocentral.org. From there, you will know once the capacity is reached. Church service streaming continues at our church website for those who cannot attend the live service. Second, your children will be staying with you throughout the duration of the worship service. Third, please stay home if you are not feeling well. Fourth, remember to enter and exit on designated doors. Fifth, please wear your face coverings at all times. Mask will only be provided by, for members and visitors who forget to bring theirs. Sixth, please refrain from physical contact for the safety of others and yourself. Seventh, bulletins will not be handed out by greeters but will be available at the foyer table. Eight, hand sanitizers will be available. Ninth, seating arrangements will have vacant views in between in addition to six feet distancing between different families sitting on the same pew. Tent, please drop your tithes and offerings on the plates as you exit the sanctuary after the worship service. There will be only one service until further notice, which will start at 9.30 in the morning with Sabbath school. These announcements will also be posted at our church website, alpasocentral.org. Thank you very much for your patience, and let's continue to pray together for unity and safety of our church family. Blessings to everyone. Happy Sabbath. 
We're going to sing now hymn 214, 214. We have this hope. Good morning, church. Happy Sabbath. Um, if you please bow your head and close your eyes, we'll have uh, the morning prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord and Savior, Father, we come to you again on our knees. Uh, we thank you for this week that you've given us, this week of life, Father. Um, we know there's, there's darkness out there in the world all around us, Father. We still thank you for the moments of life, the family that we do still have around us, Lord. We thank you for the breath that you allow us to draw from moment to moment the beatings of our hearts, Lord. The blood that flows through our veins, Father, because you've designed us so miraculously, Lord. We thank you for those things, Father. We thank you for uh, the ability to take your teachings and just take them out even into the world the way it is today, Lord. Uh, allowing us to shine your light in the dark places that are out there, Father. Your love, uh, Father, your acceptance the way you accepted us, Lord. Um, and then just the hope and the peace that you fill us with, Lord, each day when we commune with you. Uh, Father, we pray that you just really allow us to exemplify all of your love through the words we choose to speak, how we choose to speak them. Uh, Father, we pray that over everything else that goes on in this world, that we exemplify your love, your compassion, your understanding, Lord. Father, once again, I pray that uh, you are with those who may have uh, may have sick ones around them. We pray for the sick themselves, Father, that you're with them. That if it be in line with your will, that you, you call them to rest, Father, that you also send your comforter to be, to be with those loved ones, to be with those family members, and just remind them that this is not the end, Lord. Father, we pray uh, for just, just your word to reach our hearts this Sabbath day to just refresh us, Lord, uh, to remind us why this day was created, for us to get that rest, for man, for us to uh, revel in your word and your love, to be overjoyed by it, to have our, 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 our minds reset, our bodies reset, Father. And I pray that you help us all to do this this Sabbath day. Father, we just thank you for allowing us to see another Sabbath day. In Jesus Christ's name we pray, Lord. Amen.
Good morning, boys and girls and church families. Happy Sabbath. I want to share a story about a personal experience that taught me a very important lesson about stepping forward in faith. Over 10 years ago, I was asked to go teach at a small Seventh-day Adventist school on an island where it was usually run by teacher missionaries and student missionaries. I'd never been a teacher prior to that, nor did I have the interest to teach. But don't get me wrong, I have a deep respect for teachers because it's not an easy job to be a teacher. And that was partly why I was hesitant about accepting this call. And then throw in my lack of experience, I was like, no, thank you. But I decided to pray about it because I was asked at a time when my relationship with God got stronger and I was really eager to serve Him and do His will. And um, after some time of prayer, it became very clear to me that that was what God wanted me to do. And at that time, I didn't know why, but I just decided to step forward in faith anyways. So Dion was three years old at that time. We were living in Washington and my husband was on a deployment. So Dion, myself and my sister, who was living with us, um, started, you know, there was a lot of planning and action in moving our stuff into storage and going back to the islands. We arrived only a few days before school started and I remember feeling very unprepared and scrambling to get my assigned classroom ready and also figuring out how to fill out a lesson plan and I pretty much scanned through the textbooks that I was supposed to read from, I mean teach from. And I did all of this until school started only a few days later. And the first day of school came and I was filled with many mixed emotions, but the biggest one was panic. I was like, what did I get myself into? But then, you know, I was comforted with the fact that God was with me and everything will be fine. And he really was. It didn't take long for me to realize that I wasn't the only one who wasn't sure about what I was doing. So many of the other teachers felt the same way and we had to learn quick and we did. We we had to stay up late at night, um, planning out our lectures, filling out lesson plans and grading. And there was a time when we didn't have enough teachers, but then after a lot of prayer, God filled those slots and we finally felt some relief. And unfortunately, not long after that, there was a tragic event that happened. One of the young student missionaries went out for a jog. <clears throat> she didn't come back. We found out later that something bad happened to her. And this, uh, this really scared a lot of, you know, the teachers and even the locals were very shocked. So again, um, we were short on teachers again because some teachers decided to leave, rightly so. So it became a difficult time again, trying to shuffle around to, um, you know, basically make things work until we get new teachers. But at that time, we were thinking, I mean, surely no one would want to come after such a tragic event. But then God was faithful and he provided and the people that he brought to fill in those slots, they came with fire, passion and, and courage to, to serve God and the school. Uh, during that time, we really learned to rely on each other. We prayed together while focusing on finishing up that school year. And we learned to humble ourselves and help each other carry one, ano one another's burdens. But most importantly, we saw God's hand in everything throughout that year. And we witnessed answered prayers, spiritual growth, and we even created lifelong friendships with our teachers, with the fellow teachers and our students. And that really made our growth grow even more, seeing the power of God in that tough year. What could have been the worst year ever, did not turn out to be the best year, but it was so full of blessings, even among all those uncertainties. Nowadays, we're in a time of uncertainty. We're adjusting to new norms. And I know that it can be very difficult, especially when the changes are happening so fast. 
But fortunately, you know, we have a God who is very powerful and he's going to get us through. Just like the time he got me through that tough, you know, 10, 11 months, he's going to get us through as well. So I wanted to end this story with a verse from Joshua 1, 9, and it says, Be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened or dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Good morning and happy Sabbath, Church. I hope and pray that all of you are staying safe and rejoicing in the Lord. Amidst these trying experiences we are all going through, God is still good and He is good all the time, no matter what and how the devil tries to tarnish God's love and goodness. Amen? Before we proceed to God's message, Shall we ask the Holy Spirit to be with us? Let us pray. Lord God, we bow down in recognition of your holiness. We thank you for allowing us to worship you this blessed Sabbath day. Before we proceed to the study of your word, we humbly pray to please send the Holy Spirit to teach us today. Thank you for coming to each of our hearts. May you alone will be praised, and that we will be drawn closer to you. In Jesus' precious name, we pray, amen. How do you see God? Do you see God the Father different from God the Son? Do you see God in the Old Testament different from the God of the New Testament? How do you see him in your day-to-day -day life? Do you see him as a God who at a moment's notice 
will strike back at you with lightning bolt for the lies, gossips, hateful words you utter. If that would be the kind of God you know who finishes every wrong act we've done, I bet all of us should be dead by now. Did you see God as a tyrant that would punish every wrong deed you've done? And in that order to appease him, you have to give him some form of an offering? Did you think that because you have not been faithful in your tithe, that's why you lost your job during this pandemic? And if you give tithe, he will give back your job or will increase your income. Are we trying to bribe God? I hope that's not the reason why we faithfully return tithes and give offerings. Do you come to church because you are scared that God will punish you for not worshiping Him in church? That is why you come to church and give your peace offerings? Isn't that hedonism or paganism? Pagans believe that when something bad happened to them, it is because they made their gods angry and that they have to make some kind of offering to appease them. They offer treasures. They offer their best harvest. They offer animals. Or sometimes they offer even their own children. Those beliefs have no Christian basis. Because my Bible says that my God is love. And Ellen White in Steps to Christ, page 10, says, God has bound our hearts to him by unnumbered tokens in heaven and in earth. Through the things of nature and the deepest and tenderest earthly ties that human heart can know, he has sought to reveal himself to us. Can you still see the beautiful colors of God's creation? You don't need to have to go far. Even just around you here, you can witness them. Can you still hear the birds sing? Do they still sing beautifully? Even if you don't feed them, you can hear their praises to their creator. I still enjoy birds singing and playing in our backyard. Can you still see the flowers bloom? Can you still enjoy your garden? Even you don't water them reg regularly, they grow together with the weeds. But even with the outst outstanding evidences, people think otherwise and formulate baseless theories. They not only shun away what the Bible say, but create ideas contrary to what the Bible says. Come with me again to Steps to Christ, page 11. It says, Though all these evidences had been given, the enemy 
of good blinded the minds of men so that they looked upon God with fear. They thought of him as severe and unforgiving. Satan led men to conceive of God as being whose chief attribute is stern justice. One who is a severe judge, a harsh, exacting creditor. He pictured the creator as being who is watching with jealous eye to discern the errors and mistakes of men that he may visit judgment upon them. What are the thoughts of God during these challenging times of COVID-19 pandemic and global economic depression? Are you fearful of God or even angry at Him for all these things that are happening around us? Well, that's what the devil would like to portray God in the thoughts and hearts of man. The master liar, the devil likes to insinuate in the minds of men that all these challenging events are caused by God. Ellen White in page 13 of Steps to Christ it says, it was to remove this dark shadow by revealing to the world the infinite love of God that Jesus came to live among men. But this great sacrifice was not made in order to create in the Father's heart a love for man. Jesus came to disprove certain lies about God. Jesus came to prove that God's government is founded in love. And by the way, Jesus did not come to earth in order for the Father to love us. He did not come here to change the Father's heart on us. For the Father already loved us even before Christ came to dwell and die for us. It was God's love that sent Jesus on earth for our sins. As John said in John 3.16, For God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten son that whatsoever believeth and whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. The father already loved us for that reason. And he cannot just give up on us. He has given the ultimate sacrifice his only son. He has given everything he has for us because he loves us. Not the other way around. It's not because he has given everything to us. That's why he loves us. And this love also gives us an example how to treat one another in love. Come with me to Matthew 5, verses 43 and 44. You have heard that it was said, You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you. And pray for those who speak spitefully use you and persecute you. You will say, that's unfair 
Are you kidding? Why do I have to feed my in-laws who are pain in the neck? Why do I have to greet my neighbors who almost run me over? Why do I have to do good to people who do bad things to me? What for? Besides, I don't have to do that. And yes, we have to love the very person that hates us, just like how God treated us. And for that reason, detailed in verse 45 of, of the same chapter, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. For he makes his son rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. John is saying here, love those who hate you for you to become the children of God. For God sends rain and makes the sun shine to both the bad and the good. For God, our Father, does not play favoritism. God does not depreciate different Shaped. God does not discriminate. Likewise, when there's calamities, question is, are the bad people only affected? Even churches when were destroyed during the worst storm or during the worst wildfires, are only the bad people starved during drought? Were those people who got sick and others died with COVID-19 only bad people? Are only the bad people the only one affected with this economic depression brought about by this pandemic? Of course not. Everyone is affected. And continuing in verses 46 through 48. For if you love those who love you, what reward have you? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet your brethren only, what do you do more than others? Do not even the tax collectors do so? Therefore, you shall be perfect just as your Father in heaven is perfect. So if you want to be perfect like God, you have to love like God. Maybe your picture of God is influenced by what you see at home. Maybe the atmosphere at home reveals God as harsh and angry that punishes every mistakes, but comes down and even give rewards when you do good. Maybe your picture of God is influenced by a church that reveals God as stern and judgmental. But the Bible concept of God is that He is love. God's very nature is love. Everything he does. Because God is love. That's what 1 John 4, 7 and 8 says. Beloved, let us love one another. For the love is of God. And everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. You may say that God's love is revealed only in the New Testament, but that's wrong. The whole scriptures, 
reveal God's love for humanity. Aside from creation story, there are a lot of instances that God has declared His love to men in the Old Testament. Let's take, for instance, the story of Jonah's call to Nineveh. You know the story. Jonah tried to run away from God. Instead of going to Nineveh, the capital of Assyria, he boarded a ship bound for the opposite direction. Instead of going east, he went westbound for Tarsus. Why? Because he didn't want to evangelize the great city of Nineveh. And why is that? Was Jonah scared knocking on doors? Was he scared of preaching the good news? Was he scared of the people of Nineveh? What was he scared of? You know, Jonah was a seasoned evangelist. So it was not the preaching that he was scared of. He can talk with God of almost anything since he was a prophet. Jonah ran away because he knew God. He knew God's loving character and his good intention for Nineveh. The Ninevites are one of the Jews' fiercest enemies. And Jonah wanted them punished instead and not saved. But despite of Jonah's stubbornness, God still sought him and brought him safely to the place where he intended him to be, to evangelize the people he didn't want to be saved in the first place. Have you had experience like that? You want to serve the Lord, but you want to serve Him on your terms. You want to serve Him only to the place where you want to go. I'll go anywhere, Lord, especially if there's an internet connection, if the people are receptive and warm. And don't forget, I need a car that is reliable to go places, that is safe, of course, and so on and so forth. God was not through with Jonah yet. God was working on Jonah just as he was calling him to the work. He has given Jonah another chance, just he has intended to give another chance to the Ninevites. Let's go to Jonah chapter 2 and in verse 10. So the Lord spoke to the fish, and it vomited Jonah onto dry land. So here was another chance of Jonah to be right with God's calling as well. What a loving God. Amen. Proceeding to Jonah chapter 3. And in verse 1 it says, Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time. And saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and preach to it the message 
that I will tell you. So Jonah rose and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceeding great city, a three-day journey in extent, and Jonah began to enter the city on the first day's walk. Then he cried out and said, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown with the power of the Holy Spirit. Jonah evangelized the whole city for 40 straight days. Do you think if Jonah can do it with the aid of the Holy Spirit, we can do it too? And in verse 5, So the people of Nineveh believed God, proclaiming, proclaimed a fast and put on sackcloth, from the greatest to the least of them. Praise the Lord. The Ninevites listened to God's warning through Jonah. So even the fiercest and hateful people can change through the converting power of the Holy Spirit. Amen? In verse 6, Then the word came to the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne and laid aside his robe, covered himself with sackcloth and sat in ashes. That's the king of Nineveh, humbling himself before the Lord. So it's possible also that the government officials and people who has high status in society would listen when the Holy Spirit works in them and through us. Amen? Isn't it encouraging? So when you imagine if the whole nation pray for our government leaders, there will also be a reformation of a great magnitude in high places. And continuing verses 7 to 10, and he caused it to be proclaimed and published throughout Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles, saying, let neither man or beast herd nor flock Taste anything, do not let them eat or drink water. But let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and cry mightily to God. Yes, let everyone turn from his evil way and from the violence that is in his hands. Who can tell if God will turn and relent and turn away from his fierce anger so that we may not perish? Then God saw their works and they turned from their evil way and God relented from the disaster that he had said he would bring upon them. And he did not do it. What father will not be touched by it? How much more for a God of love who is all merciful and gracious, who has given them chances after chances, and now they have really listened and repented. But when the Ninevites listened and repented, Jonah wasn't happy at all. Let's see what he had to say to God. Come with me to Jonah chapter 
4, verses 1 and 2. It says, But it displeased, displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he became angry. So he prayed to the Lord and said, Ah, Lord, was not this what I said when I was still in my country? Therefore, I fled previously to Tarsus, for I know that you are a gracious and merciful God, slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness, one who relents from doing harm. So here was the reason why he did not want to go to Nineveh in the first place. Out of the abundance of his evil thoughts towards the people of Nineveh, his mouth spoke. He knew God would have compassion on them. He knew God would forgive them and would relent his punishment. What a strange reaction. So even if he was evangelizing for 40 days, he was hoping God would still punish them. I would say that was really strange. How can you be working for God throughout the length of time when all your thoughts would be evil against that person or group of people? Or how can you be worshiping together if we have animosities or don't like one another? Let's go to Ellen White book, Prophets and Kings, page 271. Say, Jonah was jealous. When God learned of God's purpose to spare the city that withstanding its wickedness had been led to repent in sackcloth and ashes. He should have been the first to rejoice because of God's amazing grace. But instead, he allowed his mind to dwell upon the possibility of being regarded as a false prophet. Jealous of his reputation, he lost sight of the infinitely greater value of the souls that wretched city. Do we value more of our reputation when we work for God? Do we value what people may say against us when we tell them about the gospel of Jesus Christ? Are we thinking more of the outcome when we work for God? Remember, it's not about you. It's not about us. We are the workers but it is not our harvest. It is God's harvest. During evangelism or when we give Bible study, sometimes we want people to make decision to accept the truth. We are presenting and be baptized right away. But it is not in our own timing. It is not in our power to produce believers or saints for God. It is not in our power to change people. The result of our labor is in the hands of God in His right timing. And yes, God empowers and equips us to do the work He wants us to do. But He alone has the control over the outcome. He alone has the power to convict 
a person to change his ways and accept the truth that is being presented. And may I remind you, we have no control of the result and transformation of any person or people. It is in his perfect timing that he will produce the result that we long to see from our labor. And sometimes we may not even see the result in our time. But rest assured, when we work faithfully for the Lord, it will not come void. That's what Jesus said. We just have to believe it. And so back to Jonah, he prayed a strange prayer on verse 3 of Jonah chapter 4. Therefore, now, O Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. What a strange prayer. Jonah knew God would forgive the Ninevites, and he was angry at God, jealous of his reputation to be called a false prophet. Instead of celebrating that his evangelism was a success and hundreds, if not thousands, got converted, Jonah, like Moses, he knew that God was a loving and merciful God. When Moses asked God to see his glory, God declared to him his glorious character covering Moses with his hand. God passed by, passed by him and proclaimed his name. Exodus 34 and in verse 3 it says, And the Lord passed by before him and proclaim the Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and in truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, and that will be by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and upon the children's children unto the third and to the fourth generation. And because of his love, he sent his one and only son to reconcile us back to him. However, Jesus was not the only one on the cross. According to Apostle Paul, God was with Christ on the cross, suffering with him, reconciling the fallen world back to him. Let's read 2 Corinthians 5.19. It says, That is, that God was in the we was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Christ was the medium through which God could pour out his infinite love upon a fallen world. God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. God suffered with his son in the agony of Gethsemane in our behalf. The Holy Trinity were in one purpose to reach out for fallen humanity. Calvary, the heart of infinite love, paid the price for our redemption. 
God was in Christ to win the world to himself. That is the God I know and that is the God I preach. The God that has amazing love that will not let you go. There was a story some years ago on a hot summer day in South Florida. A little boy decided to go for a swim in the old swimming hole behind his house. In a hurry to dive into the cool water, he ran out the back door and flew into the water, not realizing that as he swam towards the middle of the lake, an alligator was swimming toward the shore. His mother in the house was looking out the window. She saw the two as they got closer and closer together. In utter fear, she ran towards the water, yelling to her son as loudly as she could, Come back! Come back! Hearing her voice, the little boy became alarmed and made a U-turn to swim to his mother. But it was too late. Just as he reached her, the alligator reached him by the leg. From the dock, the mother grabbed her little boy by the arms just as the alligator snatched his legs. That began an incredible tug of war between the two. The alligator was much stronger than the mother. But the mother was much too passionate to let go. A farmer happened to drive by, heard her screams, raised from his truck, took aim and shot the alligator. Remarkably, after weeks and weeks in the hospital, the little boy survived. His legs were extremely scarred by the vicious attack of the animal. And on his arms were deep scratches where his mother's fingernails dug into his flesh in her effort to hang on to the son she loved. The newspaper reporter who interviewed the boy after the trauma asked if he would show him his scars. The boy lifted his pant legs and then with obvious pride, he said to the reporter, but look at my arms. I have great scars on my arms too. I have them because my mom wouldn't let go. You and I can identify with that little boy. We have scars too. No, not from an alligator or anything quite so dramatic, but the scars of a painful past, the scars of a painful experience, the scars of a painful relationship. And some of those scars are unsightly and have caused us deep regret and even major depression. But some wounds, my dearly beloved, are because God has refused to let go. In the midst of your struggle, 
He's been there holding on to you. The scripture teaches that God loves you. If you have Christ in your life, you have become a child of God. He wants to protect you and to pr provide for you in every way, especially at these challenging times. When you think he is nowhere to be found. But sometimes we foolishly wade into dangerous situations. The swimming hall of life is filled with peril. And we forget that the enemy is waiting to attack. That's when the tug of war begins. And if you have the scars of his love in your arms, be very, very grateful. He did not and will not let you go. Shall we pray? Father God, our loving Heavenly Father, thank you for your message today. We heard you loud and clear. Thank you for accepting us as we are. We may never stop trusting in you who gave us Jesus as our assurance of your love, your grace, and your mercy. And now, people of God, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Amen.